God. The Dukes are going to corner the entire frozen orange juice market. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and oh, thank God it's Monday. No, seriously, Joe's mom bought the 2019 edition of the crazy holiday calendar, and today we found out is National Thank God It's Monday. Uh, day. To celebrate, let's help you lock down your retirement with the smartest guy in the room when it comes to retirement planning. Say hello today to Larry Swedro. Plus, in our headline segment, lots of people moved money to treasuries to start 2019. Is that a bad sign for the market this year? We'll also throw out the Haven Lifeline, answer a letter from the mailbag, and have a blast with my amazing trivia. And now, two guys who are barely surviving the cold way up here in the north, Joe and O-J-J-J-J-G. Whose silly decision was this? Not entirely sure. To move the basement but in January. It doesn't rhyme with me. No. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Freezing Cold Podcast. I'm Joe Salci. I average Joe Money on Twitter. And it is our first full week in the new, more remodeled than the old basement, basement. You know it's like 68 degrees in Texarkana today, right? It. I'm sure it is. I. Th- th- they probably planted palm trees all over the place, created some new Everybody's beaches. in the pool. There's a barbecue going on. Absolutely. Round of golf. Everybody's in shorts and t-shirts. Easy. I'm sitting right here, man, across the table like the from you. Fuzzy, we have to wear those fuzzy, furry hats. By the way, that guy rubbing it in across the card table from me, it's uh, Mr. We Call Him OG, which is short for um, uh, Dude Rubbing It In. Isn't that what OG stands for? That's all right. I'll get back on a plane in another hour and head home. We'll be nice and warm for another two days. Hey, when you're ready to uh, send me pictures about that, make sure you send them on Slack. Thanks to Slack for supporting Stacky Benjamin. Slack's a collaboration hub for work. Make sure the right people in your team are always in the loop or all get to see OG rubbing it in. And key information always at their fingertips, like the weather reports from Texarkana. They'll learn more at Slack.com. Also, big thanks to Magnify Money. You know, when you're ready to get your debt taken care of here in the new year or you want better financial products in your corner, what's a better time to do that than right now? StackyBenjamins.com. Got to do all this stuff right now. Absolutely. Forward slash Magnify Money. I would do it right now, but I'm unpacking boxes. I swear, I have unpacked so many boxes. And the bad news is I feel like the house still, still is just full of boxes. Well, I think it's funny because you did the like the two stage move where you did the pods and then you moved again. And you probably thought when you moved the second time, like, this is all my stuff because we did that when we moved to Dallas. We had like the stuff that they put at the apartment and then the stuff that was in storage. And we moved the stuff from the apartment to the new house. And we're like, OK, cool. Oh, that's right. We have some we have a few things over at the storage unit. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> We had so much crap. I'm so excited like, about becoming uh, a minimalist. Can we not move this? Cheryl and I donated a bunch of stuff. We got rid of a bunch of stuff. I'm so ready to get rid of more. I just can't wait yeah. to get rid of more. I'm I'm super yeah. on Well, that you live train. like six months without it or, you know, four months without it. So how important is it to begin with? Yeah. No. Great, great stuff. Well, today's show is important. Larry Swedro, OG, in the basement. Talk about Doug said smartest guy in the room. He totally is the smartest guy in the room. Coming out swinging in 2019. I like it. It is amazing. He's going to talk about a safe and secure retirement. We're going to talk to him specifically about investments here early in 2019. But first, You might have an opinion about that. You might have one or two. Just a small, informed opinion. First, we have some headlines. So let's get the party started. Hello, darlings. And now, it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamins headlines. Our first headline comes to us from Money, money money.com, and this is written by Ian Salisbury. This is how much money you should have in stocks at every age. I thought I'd, uh, you know how you were just making fun of me earlier? I thought I'd bring this to the table to kind of uh, press your buttons a little bit, OG. 
If you want to secure retirement, the piece reads, you can't just save. You also need to make sure your investment portfolio keeps pace with inflation. For most Americans, that's going to mean investing in the stock market, whether inside a 401k or at an online brokerage. But determining how much of your money to put in stocks can be tricky. When you're young, the hardest part may simply be getting started. In your 40s, it's riding out the market's ups and downs without losing your cool. After you finally retire, you need to make those hard-earned savings last. Understanding some simple investing precepts can make the job a lot easier and up your odds of success. To get started finding the right balance of stocks and bonds for you, read on. So far, I disagree with none of this. Sounds good. Okay. What's the catch? Very nice beginning. Starting out, the conundrum. This is the time when you're supposed to invest fearlessly, taking big risks so you can reap big rewards years down the road. But it's easier said than done. The generation that came of age during the Great Recession hasn't had an easy time financially. After graduating into the weakest job market memory, you found yourself saddled with record amounts of student loan debt as well as soaring rents and home prices. As a result, many young people don't have a lot left over to invest. One recent study by the National Institute on Retirement Security found Two-thirds of millennials have nothing safe for retirement. Even millennials who are ready to invest don't necessarily favor stocks. Blame perhaps memories of the 2008 market crash, which took place when the oldest millennials were in their mid-20s. Just when they entered the workforce, they lived through the second largest stock market drop in history, says Brian Schmehel, a financial planner in Chicago. A recent bank rate study asked millennials about their favorite long-term investment. More than half said cash or real estate. While only 23% cited the stock market, the rest listed overly conservative options like gold and bonds. Gold is conservative. Okay. First one to jump the shark there or overly speculative ones like cryptocurrencies. The solution invest just a little to get started while setting aside money may be hard. It's easier than ever to get into the market over the past decade. More and more 401ks have begun auto enrolling participants, unless you opt out your employer may have already taken the leap for you. A lot of investing just boils down to, especially early on or or as you're kind of turning over a new leaf, this is the beginning of the year, so people are thinking like, okay, maybe I should get into this or I should start doing it. A lot of it is just setting it up automatically and being okay with the uncomfortableness for a little while. Whether it's something as simple as, okay, I'm going to start my 401k at 3% or I'm going to take $50 a month out of my checking account and I'm going to dollar cost average into a mutual fund. The first time you do that, it's painful because you miss the cash. But then the next time you do it, it's not as painful. And then pretty soon you just, you just don't, you just don't realize it's happening. I've used this strategy personally and with clients that every single time you make just a small little change, whether it's a 1% change in your 401k every six months. I mean, if you're making $65,000 a year and you're putting in 10%, yeah, you're going to notice a $500 a month difference. But if you're already at 10% and you go, okay, I want to do 11, you're not going to notice the 50 bucks this month. So just do it. You can always change back. They talked also about people that are young and just starting out might not have much left over to invest. I think that means, especially for your long-term savings, OG, you should be aggressive because you don't have much to invest. And I see people all the time make the mistake, well, I don't have much, so I need to just put it in a savings account. Well, okay, if you're building your emergency fund, that's fine. But if it's for long-term savings, I think that means you should be aggressive. Yeah. And the other thing that I think is really important to do is when you identify other areas of income, you know, uh, we, we talk a little bit about side hustles or hey, I've got this other thing that pays me $100 a month or $500 or whatever it is. Don't ever capture that money, whether it's side hustle money or whether it's a, hey, I got a bonus or I got a pay raise this year. Just you don't need it. I mean, if you're already putting food on the table and lights on the house and you're heating it and that sort of thing, if, if you get another $500 a month paycheck, just put it away right from day one. But you and I have been there. You think you need it. You think hmm. you need it. You've got 50 oh, million short-term priorities that you think are more oh, important no, no. than saving it for long-term. Yeah. Well, do this. Make a bargain with yourself. Say, this pay raise I'm going to save, but the next one I'll 
use for those short-term projects because you'll get another one. It might be six months from now or a year from now. So just don't put off the saving and investing. Put off the short-term project. It's not that big of a deal. What do you think about this idea they have here is gold is a conservative option? What's the emoji for the head exploding? Yeah. I can't remember. Yeah. Uh, yeah no, it's not. A gentleman. It's a diversifier. Uh, like precious metals in general, commodities are a diversifier. A well known uh, uh, financial writer, Walter Uptegrave, wrote uh, recently that gold is eight times more volatile than the stock market. Like just the general wiggle, the up yeah. and down, the standard deviation, uh, as we call it, you know, to keep it simple. We just call it standard deviation. <laughs> the wiggles. The, uh, you know, uh, commodities, precious metals, and that sort of thing. Really great diversifier. Last year, the S&P was down, what, about uh, 5 or 6%, I guess, for the year. And uh, oil was down like 40%. So you got a diversified approach. You had some of your money down 6 and some of your money down 45 I'm sure Larry Swedro will talk about this. <laughs> that was a joke. But okay. <laughs> You're like, even laughing, man. Just, That's a good one. I am. It's a good one to start a Monday. Moving right on. Uh, finding the right mix, this piece says. An all-stock portfolio is the biggest potential upside and the biggest downside risk. I'm sure Larry Swedro will have some things to say about that. Bonds can add ballast to your portfolio. Ballast, by the way, equals weight. Weight in a balloon makes it go down. Just... <laughs> Just yeah. to let you know. <laughs> or in a boat, it makes it this, you know, slow down. And yes. All that. Anchor. It sounds like a great idea. Yeah. Mid-career. Let's talk about these people. The conundrum, if you're mid-career, by the time you've reached your 40s, you should have a good amount saved for retirement. Ideally, according to investment firm Fidelity, you should have socked away three to four times your annual salary by now. In reality, the average 401k balance for savers in their early 40s is about $87,000. But either way, you've still got decades before retirement. Your savings should be an upward trajectory. That means you should own plenty of stocks, especially if you're behind on saving and hoping for investment gains to help you make up some of the lost ground. Nevertheless, it's not quite so simple as when you were in your 20s and early 30s. Now that you've got a real nest egg, market gyrations can start to feel awfully scary. There's a real risk that when the market plunges, you'll panic and decide to sell your investments at a low price. Uh, very difficult time for people mid-career here when compared to millennials when they see the market start bouncing around. For the first time in 10 years, people now, oh, gee, going, what? Wait a minute. How did I lose all that money? Well, well and the uh, reaction that you had in 2008 may not have been the same reaction you had in 2018 because you had – $45,000 that you saw go down to $25,000. And now you have $450,000 that you saw go down, you know, 80 or 90 grand in a three month period. And that could feel a lot different. You know, we always talk about percentages and say, well, the likelihood of this portfolio will range between this percent and that percent. And everybody kind of nods and says, yeah, whatever. But when you turn it into real dollars, you can't spend percentages. So you start putting it into real dollar terms and say, you know, you've got a million dollars, but there's a one in five chance that this year it will go down to 650,000. How do you feel about that? People go, wait, hold, hold the, phone. what's going to happen? Huh? Huh? <laughs> what do you mean? Uh, how, how, what's it doing? Oh, oh, oh. right, so I could wake up in a year from now and this could be worth 650? No, 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 no. I'm not going to want to do that. The solution, it says, is while you may still be decades from retirement, it's time to start gradually dialing back your hefty stock exposure. Chances are he's felt pretty good about stocks these days. Over the past decade, the S&P 500 has returned to over 14% a year on average. But most planners warn the potential gains from a more aggressive portfolio with, say, 80% or more in stocks no longer match the big cost. Quote, when you've seen 10 years of almost uninterrupted gains, it's easy to be complacent, warns Houston financial planner Ashley Foster. But when something happens, and it will, you could be exposed. And I take issue with that. I think you got to start with the end in mind. Start with when you need that dollar. I mean, just because you're 20 or 30 years away from retirement isn't a time to begin putting five-year and 10-year instruments in your portfolio. Well, and this is the part of, I think, behavioral counseling that that people need, which is you have to know yourself. And if you're going to get freaked out by seeing your 401k statement every month, you need to stop it so you don't look at it. You need to have somebody put as a buffer between you and looking at your account performance. It reminds me of that study that Fidelity did, inadvertently did, which was the best performing portfolios over whatever period of time, you know, it was during the recession. 
and they found they had a subset of people whose portfolios did the best and everybody tried to figure out what those, you know, what the makeup of those portfolio, were they professional traders? Were they wealthy investors? Were they kids? You know, what, no, they were all dead. The people who were dead had the best performance. And the reason was because they didn't do anything. And that often is the right answer. Don't do anything. Next up are people either at or closing in on retirement. I'm going to skip this part. We're going to talk to Larry Swedrow specifically about retirement. So I'm going to skip that. But if you want to take a look at this piece, a uh, very thorough piece from money, head to stackybedjamins.com and hit up our show notes and you'll see a link to this piece. And because we plan on talking to Larry for an extended period of time, a little extended version of the main guest today, wanted to point to a tweet by Eric Balkanas, ETFs took in $5 billion in the first day of the year, uh, 2019, almost all went to intermediate and long-term treasury ETFs. And he asked in his tweet, does this uh, portend, is this a foreshadowing of what the market's going to do? OG, what do you think? I think this is 100% behavioral, right? It's I looked at my investment accounts and went, oh, I don't want any of that. That stuff's down a whole bunch. Uh, but let me put it all in this other stuff that's uh, it's doing good. It's up 3%. So and they all sound like foghorn leghorn. I say it, I say it, I say it, put it in, put it in the safe stuff. <laughs> that's what all, that's what everybody that put their money in there sounds like, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly. That. Yeah. I think that's lesson one, uh, which is when the market's down, don't take all your money and put it in intermediate long-term treasuries. Oh, long-term uh, bonds. That's going to be a, ask him the for interest it. rates rising. Just ask him just, for it. Just uh, thank you, sir. May I have another? And then lesson number two, I think the big lesson from putting money in the market, I love this at the beginning of the year, especially automate, automate. You get that raise, you get the money, automate. The more you don't see your money, the better off you're going to be. Coming up in a second, we'll have our big so what from the headlines. But before we do that, we should talk about something, OG, that's going to make automation easier later on, and that's automating to the right places. And when we look at all the places out there that you can that you can move your money to or use to pay down your debt or whatever it is, it's mind-boggling. So what if, what if, call me crazy, what if there were a place where you could go and over 92% of all the stuff that's available online was not only in one place, but also they had a very simple system of rating them against each other. Wouldn't that be incredible? It's crazy talk. Does such a thing exist? It is mind blowing that that might exist. Stackybedjamins.com forward slash magnify money. Magnify money is the name of the site. You may have heard of it before. Actually, we're going to have the founder of magnify money, Nick Clements here on Wednesday talking about your debt cleanse. Because it seems like people, according to a study magnify money just did, they might've gone a little crazy over the holidays. <laughs> yeah. Tell me about it. I just saw that, um, Goldman Sachs, which is one of those savings account places. Marcus. That, that, that Marcus, the Marcus savings account. I just saw that they raised their rates another quarter percent. I uh, saw it on Twitter the other day. So expect all the other ones to follow suit. And those that don't, might be time to go get your free few hundred dollar bonus. The other thing that's really interesting too, and I thought about this over the holiday time because I was had a little time to just kind of play around on my phone. How about all those things that you get advertisements for of open an account and we'll give you $400. Open an account, set a direct deposit, we'll give you $500. I saw an article that some guy did that and made like 2800 bucks last year. <laughs> he made far more. On, on yes. bouncing around. It's all, it's all interest income, right? You can sure. pay taxes on it, but that's a pretty good side hustle. Made $3,000 almost. Just transfer money back and forth. And I know a lot of those places are on are on uh, Magnify Money, so stack it with your high interest rate. Although you won't find that strategy on Magnify Money. You won't see that well, one. Probably not. No. You, you heard it here first. Stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Magnify Money. Whether you're paying down debt, less interest to the man, you're trying to play the credit card reward game for people that obviously pay off their credit cards every month, you should be getting cashback rewards. Whatever it is, also an award-winning blog led by our friend Mandy Woodruff, just a phenomenal editor of that blog, stackybedjamins.com forward slash magnify money to compare, ditch, switch, and save. 
I think our takeaways today, OG, from our headlines, number one, I like this idea of automate, no matter what part of your saving cycle you're in. I also like the idea of teaching yourself not to look at it when things aren't going the way that you want with the financial markets. And then the idea of long-term treasuries, what's our takeaway there? Yeah, don't do that. Don't, 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 don't. Don't do that. Not with your long-term money. Please, no. Larry Swedrow, Upstairs Talking to Mom. Larry was among the first authors to publish a book that explained the science of investing in layman's term. That was called The Only Guide to a Winning Investment Strategy You'll Ever Need. He since authored only seven other books, What Wall Street Doesn't Want You to Know, Rational Investing in Irrational Times, A Successful Investor Today, and more. He's also co-authored an additional seven books about investing. He currently is the Director of Research at Buckingham Asset Management. Before he was at Buckingham, which he joined back in the late 90s, he had some little roles like a Vice Chairman of Prudential Home Mortgage, he has held positions at Citicor as a Senior Vice President, Regional Treasurer, responsible for Treasury, Foreign Exchange, and Investment Banking activities, including risk management strategies. He has an MBA in Finance and Investment from NYU and uh, is just an all-around great guy. So happy we finally have him on the show, Larry Swedrow, coming down to help us with your investments right now. And on my dad's shortwave, I'm so happy we have him on the show. Larry Swedros here. How are you, man? I'm doing great. Now, we talked to Matt Hall a while ago for his awesome book, Odds On. All he talked about was how Larry Swedro was the most amazing mentor he ever had. Just he, he speaks very highly of you, Larry. I did teach him everything he knows. So. <laughs> Perfect. That, that is fantastic. On the other hand, he's given me some good tennis lessons. <laughs> Uh, this, this book is so comprehensive. What made you decide that it was time to have a book that was very, very comprehensive on all of retirement instead of just picking off one area? Well, I'd written, uh, uh, up to that point, 16 books on investing, covering a wide variety of topics from stocks to bonds, to alternative investments, financial planning, behavioral finance, etc. Uh, and I wanted to write a book about retirement planning. So I went around and looked and found there were a lot of very good books that were very specific in their nature. Uh, Mitch Anthony, for example, wrote a terrific book, The New Retirement Mentality, about planning a life in retirement, which unfortunately many people don't plan. They may plan for their investments, but not enjoying a life that's meaningful in retirement. So Mitch talks about that. We have issues that are specific to women, and Social Security has to be dealt with, and Medicare, and HSAs, and all kinds of issues that need to be integrated into a well-thought-out plan, and I couldn't find a single book that covered all of these topics. So I thought that would be my contribution, is to help people by writing a book that dug pretty deeply into each of these topics and then if someone wanted to learn more, they could do more research. We provide them with recommended reading as well. I would love to talk to you about all of the issues in this book, but then we'd need you for 100 hours and not 15 minutes. So I thought we would dig into asset allocation just so, especially in this really volatile time, that people got great use of the of the few minutes we have you. And then we'll uh, have a link to the book on our show notes at stackybenjamins.com. But you talk, you talk about a couple in Minnesota in your chapter on asset allocation on investing. And they're in their 70s. And you say that they had a $13 million portfolio when you first met them. And then a few years later, you met them again, Larry, and it was down to $3 million. How the heck would something like that happen? Well, actually, I, I first met them when they had $3 million, but uh, they had told me it had been $13 million three years earlier. I was brought in as a consultant to help them to figure out you know, what could they do at this point. The problem was, number one, that they were 
working with a stockbroker who was not a fiduciary advisor. He was there to sell them products that he made money uh, with, uh, not what was in their interest per se. And I sat down and pointed out something that I talked to all investors about, which is they need to consider their ability, willingness, and need to take risk. And we focus on that in the chapter in the book. In their case, they had absolutely no need to take risk at all. They had $13 million in 1999, and they never spent more than about 100,000 a year. Now, a typical safe rule of thumb at that point would have been 4% of the portfolio. So they could have been withdrawing about a half a million dollars a year, and they would easily have not run out of money. They were only withdrawing 100,000. So why were they spending Uh, I mean, having such a high asset allocation, which is the only way you could have lost 70 percent of your money. The stock market itself had only gone down about 40 percent. So I knew just by looking at the numbers, there had to be almost all not only in stocks, but in high tech stocks as well. So I asked them a simple question. I said to them, why did you take the risk which you knew had to be there? If the downside of going from 13 to three was unthinkable, but if you doubled your money, on the other hand, let's say an alternate universe had turned out and you did well, it would probably have had no meaningful impact on your life. And the wife turned around to the husband and punched him as hard as she could in the arm and said, I told you so. So there was a case of an advisor failing to not only look at the client's ability to take risk or willingness, likely no 72-year-olds, or at that point, they were 69 when they had the 13 million, would have the stomach to absorb the risk of a 100% bear market. People today are seeing what that risk can can look like. So they exceeded their uh, willingness to take risk. They didn't really have the ability to do it, except they had a large net worth even if it gotten cut in half, they'd be okay. Even at three million, they were okay because three percent uh, or four percent of three million would have been 120 grand. They could live on that. They needed less, so they were still okay, which I assured them of. But they had no need to take risk, and that's an area that far too few people look at, especially higher net worth people. They've been successful. That's how they created this wealth. So they get are overconfident, think they could greatly increase the money, and they end up taking too much risk and then can suffer losses like that. So was, you have to think of those three issues together. I was going to ask about that because I, I understand the advisor definitely being culpable and not looking at the end goal on their end. But to what degree is the client themselves culpable for that? It seems like to a decent degree, it's it's also their fault not thinking about the risk level. Well, it's certainly you could make that case. Uh, how, however, I would say this. Uh, it is one of the great tragedies in our country, which I've written about, is that the, despite the importance of money and outside of our family and our health and maybe for some people their religion, money is the next most important thing. It's not money itself, of course, but what money can do for us, buy us a good retirement, uh, travel, vacation, the uh, shelter and food we need uh, for uh, and other good things they can buy. And yet, despite its importance, unless you get an MBA in finance today, it's highly unlikely that you've taken even a single course in capital markets theory and investing. So you're you're ignorant, not stupid. I think I'm fairly intelligent. I graduated number one in my class from one of the top MBA programs in the country at NYU. But I'm totally ignorant about lots of things like nuclear physics. My wife and three daughters tell me women is another subject I'm totally (laughs) ignorant about, uh, but it doesn't make me stupid. And that's the problem. This couple got taken advantage of by an advisor. And while, yes, they could have spent some more time learning about investing, that's another great tragedy in this country. Most Americans, I feel, would rather watch some reality TV show than spend, uh, you know, maybe five or 10 hours reading good books on investing like the ones I've written or people like John Bogle, for example, have written that teach about the science of investing 
and the prudent strategy that's most likely to enable them to uh, reach their goals. I love how you talk about risk. And, and I think that a lot of people don't think about risk enough until it's too late. Your discussion around risk begins with this idea of risk versus uncertainty. And you draw this differentiation between those two things. Could you explain that to everybody? Because I think this is a great way of parsing out why so many people fail with their portfolio decisions. Yeah, there was a famous economist named Frank Knight. He provided the definition. So risk is where we either know the odds, like at the crap tables, you know exactly what the odds are. Uh, if you count cards in poker, for example, you know what the odds are of drawing the inside straight. Actuarial science, we don't know exactly what the odds are of a person who's, say, 65 living to 90 but we have a pretty good estimate of those odds. But when it comes to investing, investors, when things are looking good and markets are doing well, we tend to think about investing as if it's risk, where we know what the odds of, say, a bear market happening in the next year are, or any stock collapsing or going way up. But with investing, we are dealing much more with uncertainty. And uncertainty is where we have no idea what the odds are. We can't estimate it. And that creates a real problem because if I ask you, would you rather make a bet where you know where the odds are or where you know where the odds aren't and you can't even estimate them well, of course, you're going to say, I'd rather take the risk of where I can estimate the odds. So I I will ask you a simple question. Can you tell me what the odds are? of a terrorist plane crashing into the World Trade Center. Yeah, n- no we, idea. We can't do that. Yeah. But investors, when we get bear markets, they now start to convert what they thought was risk. They think of it more of uncertainty. And that's when their stomachs start to rumble. They start to panic and even well thought out plans get abandoned because they don't know how to deal with this uncertainty. They don't like it. Uh, that's a real problem. And one of my favorite sayings, uh, Joe, is that the only thing you don't know about investing is the investment history you don't know. So it's important to know your history. Anyone who looks at the data knows the following. We just had a month, uh, this last quarter, high to low, the, the S&P dropped 20% intraday. Uh, end of day, it was 19.8%. Most people don't know that while that's a severe drop, we get those kind of drops with far more frequency than people believe. In the last 100 years or so, what we have is a drop of 15% about once every three years and a 20% drop about once every six. Now, think about what that means. If you're an average 35-year-old, you've got a life expectancy, say you're a couple, second to die of 90 so you got to plan 60 years because one of the two of you is likely to live longer, 50% chance. So that means you got a 60-year horizon. That means you have to live through likely 20 periods where the market is going to drop at least 15% and 15 periods, uh, sorry, and 10 periods where it will drop likely 20% or more with the average when it drops more than 20 is 38%. That means you must incorporate the virtual certainty that you're going to have severe bear markets that nobody, I assure you, can predict. You have to build that into your plan so you anticipate it. Don't take more risks than you have the ability, willingness, or need to take. And then make sure you can stay the course because once you panic and sell, you're virtually guaranteed to fail. Just think of an investor who sold on Christmas Eve with the market having now dropped 20% and says his stomach is screaming, it's reached the GMO point, which is, get me out! (laughs) And you panic and sell. Now the market went up a 1,000 points and then another several hundred. Now do you get back in or not? It's almost impossible. Swedro's law is once you panic and sell, what you've done is virtually committed portfolio suicide, it's almost impossible 
to recover unless you just get lucky. And people don't think about that, Larry, about how your psychology is different. Once you're out, your psychology is so much different than when you're in. I don't know how to describe that better because when I was, when I was an advisor and working with clients, you saw it every day. Once somebody sold their psychology completely changed and they felt so much safer on the sideline, even though you and I know that now they're going to have to save dollar for dollar for their retirement years and they're not going to make it. It's a perceived safety that really isn't there. Yeah. Let me tell you a a terrific story. This is a true and sad uh, story. That's uh, I think great for your listeners. We had a client who was the only one of two that out of the more than a thousand who I know that we had during the 08 crisis who just panicked and sold. We had two out of over a thousand because we spent so much time educating people about the risk so they were prepared for it. Not that we knew it would happen at that time, but the, that kind of loss was built into their plan as an expectation. They'd have to live through several of them. It was right before Thanksgiving of 2008, and the market had already collapsed quite a bit. And I'll never forget the words you used, which was, Larry, you're going to rebalance me into bankruptcy. Because as the market would drop 15 or 20 percent, we'd say we need to buy more equities to restore your asset allocation. They said, I just can't take I've got to get out. I tried to tell him that once you get out. It's almost impossible to get back in because it never, ever looks safe. Uh, Just think back over the last 10 years from March 9th, 2009, when we bottomed out through through September's high, there was never a single day where the market looked good. Even back as far as 2013, we had people like Jeremy Grantham, uh, who's a pretty legendary investor. He was saying market was 75% overvalued. And we had so many crises like the European crisis with Portugal, Italy, Greece and Spain maybe going bankrupt. We had Brexit. Uh, we had you know, trade wars. The U.S. lost its AAA credit rating. We actually defaulted for a few hours on our debt. We've had a series of government shutdowns. We had a Japanese earthquake that cr- could have caused tremendous. I mean, on and on and on. It never looks safe. So I pointed out to him. You're going to have to get back in at some day because you can't make your goals sitting in treasury bills or CDs. So he said, OK, uh, here's what I want to do. We're going to get out. And then on January 1, we'll check if the market's gone up. We'll get back in. And if it's down, we'll wait another month. Said so that's a plan. At least it's better than no plan. But here's what could happen. Now, I take no credit. I wasn't forecasting. Said so the market could go up. You get a rebound. You get back in and now it collapses again. And now what are you going to do? You're all going to panic again and you'll never be able to buy again after what happened. So here's what happened. He, he sold on November 20th. The market then rallied about 20 percent in the last five weeks. January 6th, he got back in or roughly that date. And then the market crashed 25 percent. And right before the, uh, it turned around, he got out again, and I never heard from him. I don't know what happened. But that's the problem. Once you get out, you're doomed to fail because there's no green light. Here's the analogy I use. You're a surfer. You go to the beach and you check to see if it's safe. All you have to do is look at the lifeguard stand. If there's a green flag. It's safe to go out. If it's red, Come back another day. You wait a day or two, the waves calm down, safe to get in. Joe, have you ever seen a green flag uh, uh, for the stock market? (laughs) I don't know about you, but I've never seen. A lot of people think they see them, but it's never really there. People thought that in late 1999, and of course, the market then crashed. So that's a real problem. You have to have a plan that you can stick with. Bear markets are a feature not a problem of stock markets. You have to bear them with equanimity. Be like Warren Buffett, whose favorite holding period is forever. And if you, he tells people to avoid timing the market. And if you can't avoid it, at least be a buyer when everyone else is panic selling and then take chips off the table when others are getting greedy. 
You you mentioned that uh, during crises, the perception about equity investing shifts from risk to uncertainty. Obviously, with this gentleman, it did that. He sees an uncertain future, says he wants no part of it, so it goes to the sidelines in the probably the worst way possible. Would you say that this particular time with the market craziness the last quarter, Larry, that this is a time of crisis? Uh, here's the interesting thing, uh, which I think is helpful to keep perspective, because when things are crashing, we tend to only focus on the negative news. And we really have a big dichotomy between the economy and the stock market. The economy is looking great. And you wouldn't know that from the stock market, but we expect economic growth to come in this year at 3%. The Philly Fed forecast, which is a consensus of about 50 of the nation's top economists, is, a, is predicting now about a 2.7% growth for next year. Very good year, only slightly slower growth than this year. We also have almost no inflation. It's running about 2%. It's expected to be about the same next year. We have unemployment at 50-year lows. Uh, just yesterday, the new claims number was again at exceptionally low levels. Consumer sentiment numbers are great despite the stock market uh, getting hit. And we have the Fed with very loose monetary policy, even if they had gone through, which now looks like it's off the table, with their uh, three more increases, one in December, which they did, and the market was expecting two more next year. Now it's expecting only one. But even if they did that, we would have seen the Fed funds rate still below 3%. And with inflation expected about two and a quarter, that's less than a 1% real rate of interest, which is less than the historical average and well below any rate that would cause the economy to slow down. The Fed typically will drive real rates up to three, four, five percent to try to slow the economy. We're nowhere near there. And on top of that, we have loose fiscal policy with a huge federal deficit. So their economic news is great, but people are focused on all the uncertainty created, unfortunately, to some degree, because we have a president who uh, is, likes to tweet and he's gone after China. He's created uncertainty about trade wars. He's created uncertainty around the Federal Reserve chairman's uh, situation. We have a shutdown of the government. And he likes to tout the economy and the stock market. Well, stock market, I believe, is mostly down to because of the uncertainty that he unfortunately has contributed to. But that's uncertainty. And what happens is people start to fear of that, and they raise the price of risk, which means they're willing to pay lower price earnings ratios and stocks can collapse. But corporate earnings forecasts are virtually unchanged from where they were. Uh, so I think there's a reasonable chance the markets could recover here because it's just sort of, to me, seems overdone unless things get worse than already expected. You've got these people then that are saying buy the dips based on much of the same data that you just shared with our audience. Uh, they're saying buy equities. We've got, we have a, a percentage of our audience that is all equities all the time. You say that that's fine in the book, but you also make it very clear that's not a free lunch. But going with an all equity portfolio is not just free money. Yeah, obviously, stocks are risky. Let me give you three data points. There are three periods of at least 13 years where stocks had worse returns than treasury bills long. We went 1929 through 1943. The market beta premium was slightly negative. So that's 15 years where you took all the risks of stocks, lived through the Great Depression, and you would have been better off in treasury bills and would have had far greater returns if you had bought longer term treasury bonds. Mm -hmm. Then we went 1969 through 82, which was 14 years, similar situation. And then we went 2000 through 2012. That's 13 years. That's a cumulative 42 years out of the 90 years we have data. That's almost half the time when stocks are risky. If you have the stomach for 100% equities, and you have the ability, willingness, and the need to do it, and aren't overconfident about your abilities to live through 
a 15-year period maybe where stocks perform poorly. And by the way, there's no guarantee they'll recover. That what people need to understand is this. The U.S. could be the next Japan. I'm certainly not forecasting that in any way. And by Japan, by the way, by Japan, just so people are clear, you mean very flat for a hell of a long period of time. I don't mean very flat. I mean much worse. In 1990, Japan was at the top of the world. The land under the imperial palace was worth more than all the real estate in California. Japanese stocks for 20 years have slaughtered U.S. stocks, even though U.S. stocks have done well. The Nikkei had hit almost 40,000. Do you know where it is today? I have no idea. 20,000. It's half the price it was 29 years ago, which means you have had dead money, negative returns for almost 30 years. That could happen here, which is an argument, of course, for diversifying globally and not having all your eggs in one basket. Uh, uh, Japanese investors who are just like you investors, we make the mistake of having 90% on average of our money in our assets. They were just as confident uh, then as U.S. investors are today. That's called a home country bias. Think of the benefits the Japanese investors got by being globally diversified. They were protected to some degree. I make no prediction about that, but the U.S. is only half of the global equity markets. So I recommend investors have only half of their U.S., uh, half of their equities in U.S. stocks. About of the remaining one half, uh, three quarters or three eighths of that uh, half would be in developed markets and one eighth in emerging because that's how the world allocates capital. And I don't think there's anyone around who's much smarter than the collective wisdom of the market. So your portfolio should look like the market in how it diversifies geographically. I would love to dig into that more, but I am way over time. But I do have to ask you one more question, Larry, which is that we talked about one one hundredth of the topics in your book, obviously for a successful retirement, you've got so many different things to talk about. I mean, as a financial planner, you know, all the problems with longevity that we could talk about problems in the annuity market and companies trying to clean that up, which I'm very excited about, about elder care abuse. You go into that, you talk about estate planning, about social security maximization, all these different things. The bad news is most people start with what we talked about today. And I think it's because it's the sexy stuff, right? We like talking about the markets. It's fun to talk about, prognosticate about what we're going to do tomorrow. Where should we really start if it's not with, with your investments? Well, the first chapter of my book was chosen as the first chapter for the very reason that you highlight. To me, the far more important thing is planning a fulfilling life in retirement. What we do know from the science and the research here is that many people get their reason for being, their sense of self-worth from their work. All their social connections come from their work. Their intellectual stimulation comes from their work. And if you don't plan a transition into a meaningful life in retirement, like imagining what your perfect day in retirement would be, write it down, what you would do hour by hour. It doesn't matter what it might be. It might be being a candy striper at a hospital three hours a day or working uh, for whatever social cause is important to you, maybe helping build homes for Habitat Humanity, whatever it is, taking courses at the local college. But you need to find something that gives purpose in your life, that keeps you connected socially uh, so you'll keep your friendships And you need something that gives you what I call a reason to get up in the morning that keeps you mentally stimulated, that mind working. What we find, unfortunately, is many people are going to retire. You have high divorce rates. It's the fastest growing divorce rate in the country are the silver divorces. We also find the highest rates of depression because people lose their meaning in their life. So I thought it important to begin the book by helping people think about this issue of planning a life in retirement. I was lucky to recruit Alan Spector, who wrote a wonderful book, uh, The Retirement Quest, and he helped me write that chapter to give people insight into that issue. The book is called Your Complete Guide to a Successful and Secure Retirement, and baby, is it uh, it complete? It is incredibly complete. Where do people get it, Larry? 
You can get it on Amazon uh, starting January 7th. Awesome. Well, th thanks, Larry. Happy New Year to you, man. And great talking to you. Thanks for spending some time with us. It's my pleasure to be here. Happy to come back anytime and maybe delve into some of those other issues we didn't get a chance to today. Hey there, money nerds. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And you know, normally I celebrate Mondays by hitting snooze on the alarm six times, banging my head on something while making breakfast and getting shampoo in my eye reverse those two i don't shampoo while i make breakfast but anyway not today for the actual national thank god it's monday holiday we'll do all of that and also gift you with some of my amazing trivia how about this little gem what professional sports team who played their first game today in 1927 also played nine games in 1959 in the soviet union for the equivalent of four thousand bucks Played to a packed house of 75,000 at Berlin's Olympic Stadium in 1951 and has made over $11 million in charitable contributions over the life of the team. I'll be back with the answer in just a moment. Big thanks to Slack for supporting Stacking Benjamins. You know, we... We use Slack extensively and even more now that uh, our producer Richie is in Texarkana and I am in Michigan. And that makes it so that we can have this team, which is more like teams these days where we all work remotely. I mean, Steve is in St. Louis. Of course, Doug is next door. OG just comes for the recordings and then he's in Dallas. We've got this team that spread all over the United States and it's pretty cool that Slack brings it all together. So what's Slack? It's a collaboration hub for work whatever you do with slack the right people in your team are kept in the loop and the information they need is always at their fingertips teamwork on slack happens in channels letting you organize conversations and information around projects offices and teams and because everything we need to work is in one place it makes it faster and easier for us to get things done it'll make it easier for you too with slack our team's better connected. You can find out more about how it helps your team at slack.com. Seriously, the amount that I used to have to email people and now the messaging feature makes it easy. And when I first installed Slack, I went messaging feature. I really don't need that. I already have messenger. Well, we can collaborate on things like as an example, a Google doc. And I get a notification in Slack that it's there. When we pass graphics back and forth or pictures back and forth or ideas uh, for the script back and forth, we can do those all in one place. It takes the 10 different tabs I had open and makes it just one simple, seamless way for us to connect. Slack has more than a thousand apps that it interfaces with. It saves us so much time, improves productivity, allows us to have voice and video calls when we're having strategy sessions, whatever it is that you do. I'm sure Slack can help you do it better like it did for us. Slack, where work happens. Learn more at slack.com. That's slack.com. Hey there, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, back with your trivia answer. Here was the question one more time. What professional sports team who played their first game today in 1927 also played nine games in 1959 in the Soviet Union for the equivalent of 4000 bucks? played to a packed house of 75000 at Berlin's Olympic Stadium in 1951 and has made over $11 million in charitable contributions over the life of the team? Well, while lots of teams have had long lifespans, one team created in 1926 by a man named A. Saperstein has entertained more than 146 million fans in 123 countries. Wait, there's that many countries? Wow. Anyway, of course, I'm talking about the Harlem Globetrotters. Get it right? Well, trot yourself on over to Joe's mom's house for some cake because you, my friend, are starting off your Monday on the right foot. Uh, in, in, unless you're left-footed. In which case, it's probably better, you know, if you started the day off on your left foot. But, you know, then again, if you're ambidextrous, oh, just f Not sure he really understands what that means. But the Harlem Globetrotters, have you ever seen the Harlem Globetrotters? If I would have heard you say entertained, you said played, I I'd have probably got it. As soon as you said the word entertained, I figured it out. There it was, right in broad view. I think it'd be fun to go see the Harlem Globetrotters. I never have. 
And uh, da, 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 da. I immediately thought of that too. The, the, the whistling and all that stuff. Hey, OG, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you, you, I'm talking to you, value me? first. You You're talking to me? You. You talking to me? I'm talking to you. Hey, look at me. I'm talking to you. Yo, over here. I'm talking to you. Dude, what do you value first? I know what you're looking at me for. We've played this game a hundred times. Yeah, but I'm out. I've played all my cards. You're pl- and nothing else to add. Game set match. We have to, in fact, I was just thinking the beginning it's the beginning of a new year. We should probably think of a new game to play. The thing that I value because most is not playing this game. Is that what you're saying? Right now it kind of is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, or it's your family and your time. Which you could be doing, spending time with them instead if I of wasn't instead of playing this game. To you, yes. Yeah. So, uh, yay for playing this game. It's why they've created a modern way to buy quality term life insurance. So instead of playing this game, you know what? Which could take lots of time. It could take just a couple minutes to finally get your house in order when it comes to your life insurance with Haven Life. Prices are affordable. Policies issued by parent company Mass Mutual application super easy and fast to complete online and they offer instant coverage decisions no waiting several weeks for a decision here's what you do stackingbenjamins.com forward slash haven life all squished together haven life got it today let's throw out the haven lifeline to our new friend joseph loving that name hey joseph Hi, Joe and OG. This is Joseph. I am an engineer that sent a letter a few weeks back. First of all, thank you for answering my letter. I am very happy with the book that you recommended, Set for Life. It is the blueprint that I was looking for, and it was exactly as advertised and exactly what I needed to read. So thank you. Secondly, I wanted to say, depending on when this comes out, happy birthday to OG. And third, which is my actual question, my wife and I are looking to get a home loan. We went through the pre-approval process, but didn't like the payments that we had qualified for. It didn't really work out with our budget. So my question is, how would I go about applying for a better loan? Uh, Would uh, raising my credit score have a large impact? And how might I do that? Thank you. And I hope I actually learned something this time. I don't like, it's funny. I just bought a new house too, Joseph. I don't like the, oh gee, I don't like the mortgage payment on ours either. Welcome to America, Joseph. I've never met anyone who likes their mortgage payment. <laughs> so. first, I just applied for a mortgage and I really don't like. Yeah, I've been paying on mine for three years and I despise it every single month, <laughs> as a matter of fact. Uh, by the way, we, we didn't talk about your birthday. How did your birthday go? Good time? Yeah, no, it was great. Yep. Yep. Came and went. Had a little uh, dinner, you know, hung out with the fellas the next day. It was fun. But thanks for asking. Hanging out with the fellas, is that a euphemism? Nope. Um, my after school activity, I got a whole bunch of our compadres from my after school activity together, and we had a little uh, a little shindig. Nice. Played some Twister? Yeah, that's exactly the game that we played. That's exactly yeah. it. All right, let's talk about let's talk about home loans. Let's get serious here for a second. Um, r- r- serious, raising serious. his raising his credit score will that help him qualify for maybe uh, more favorable terms on a mortgage? Well, I mean, it kind of just depends on where he's at. I mean, if he's at six hundred and ten on his credit score, then yeah. If he's at seven fifty five, probably not. But still, all that's yeah. going to do, Joseph, is change the interest rate on the mortgage, which well, don't has a pretty big impact. It yeah. can have a decent impact, but depending on the size house you're buying, <laughs> I think I think maybe. A smaller mortgage is yeah. is probably the, the better option. But to answer his question I mean, specifically, how does he get his credit score higher? Well, you know, that's not like a thing that you can do overnight. But the nice thing about the mortgage process, if there is a nice thing, is that really it's just all math. You know, it's just here's your interest rate. Here's your down payment. Here's the purchase price. And there's going to be some fees in there. So maybe you can negotiate away at some of those fees. But the biggest impacts are going to be the purchase price or the down payment. So if you want a lower mortgage payment, you got to have a lower priced house or a bigger down payment, you know, on the, on the house that you want to buy. 
if you've maxed all those things out as best as you can and you're like, well, the only lever I've got left is my credit score and it isn't very good so I can move it a lot. The biggest factors to credit score are payment history and utilization. What that means is, is how accurate are you on your payments? Meaning don't ever have anything go 30 days late. It becomes less impactful about two years after your last 30 day late. So if you had a 30 day late payment, but it was, you know, a year and a half ago, you'll see a marked improvement in your score in six months from now. It's still there. Lenders can still see it, but after a two year window, you know, it becomes less impactful. The biggest needle that you can move immediately is utilization. And so if you have $20,000 of available credit, if you took all your credit cards and lined them up and said, how much could I charge today on all of them if I wanted to? And that number was 20000 And your balance right now is ten, Then you have a 50% utilization. The most optimal utilization, by the way, you would think is zero. It's not. It's $2. So... It's funky, huh. but, but zero is not the best answer. But you want to have be less than 10%. So if you have $20,000 in, in uh, available credit, you don't want to have a balance that reports on your credit report more than $2,000. But here's the problem. A lot of times, people who are financially responsible will do what? You'll use your credit card every month and then pay it off. Well, guess what that does? Let's say you've got your $20,000 and your monthly expenses are five grand a month. And every month you charge five grand and you pay five grand off. Well, when you get that statement, that's the number that they report to the credit bureau. So they report, oh, got a $5,000 balance. And now you're already at 25% utilization. So to beat that game, if you can manipulate this a little bit, pay your credit card balance the day before the statement ends. And if utilization is your issue, your credit score will skyrocket because Chase will report zero balance. And the funny thing is that skyrockets fairly quickly, by the way. Immediately. Yes. Immediately. Yeah. You know, if you've got a pretty clean background, but then you've got like, well, I've got a $10,000 Visa card that I put four grand on it every month, but I pay it off. Pay that $4,000 credit card the day before the statement ends. So you can go online and see what the statement closing date is. Pay it that day so that when the reports to the credit bureau, it reports zero or $2 if you want to be real tricky and watch your credit score skyrocket. Do that, then go apply for the next mortgage at the next place with the higher score. Some companies will allow you to you know, do what's called a rescore. So you can say, okay, well, uh, what were the factors associated with my score? And if I move the needle here a little bit, you know, I took some money out of savings and paid off some debt or something like that. The other way uh, that you can influence utilization is the other end of the spectrum. So if utilization is available credit used versus available credit, well, the other way you could do it is to get more available credit. Obviously, the place you can go to for that is is magnify money. But the problem, if there is one with that, is that in the mortgage buying process, the bankers may look at that and say, well, why did you need another $10,000 credit card? Bill? Right, right. What do you know that we don't? your new $10,000 credit limit. So be careful with that. You could ask your existing credit card companies for a credit line increase. That could also have the same impact. But all of those will just kind of slightly change the rate. Biggest impact is going to be purchase price and down payment. And if you're really frisky, you could go for one of those 50 or 60 year mortgages that... <laughs> I'm just kidding. Don't do that. Please don't. Yes. Here's what you do. Just take out a longer mortgage. And yeah. Then you, yeah. What you need is a, one of those 98-year mortgages, uh, interest only. No, don't do that. Don't do that. You're gonna but s- your house payment shouldn't be more than 25% of your gross income, or you got to change your expectations on houses. That's the- why I always tell people when we're shopping for houses, you can't look. If your budget's 450000 do not walk into a $600,000 house. I will sum it up for you. $600,000 houses generally look a lot nicer than $450,000 ones. They have crown molding in different places. And you go, wow, that's a big bathroom. You know, they have more stuff. And $800,000 houses look a lot nicer than $600,000 houses generally. Don't walk into them. The realtor doesn't have your best interest at heart. They're trying to get a sale. You know, so shop in your budget, stay in your lane. Magnify Money has a calculator 
that looks at your gross monthly income and where you live and how long it'll take then for you to save enough money. I like that calculator, but if you just want to play around, there is no calculator that just goes through different mortgage options for that one. I'd uh, swap over to bank rate. So if you go over to bankrate.com, you'll find uh, mortgage calculators there, which I would, uh, I would use to look at different options when it comes to, uh, to taking out a mortgage. Yeah. You got to define it too. I mean, you just talk to the banker who's helping you with it. Are you, are, if you go through all this rigmarole of trying to change your credit score, is it going to change the interest rate by a tenth of a percent? You know, like I said, if your credit score right now is 620, yeah, it will make a big difference for you to get to 720. If you're at 755, it will make no difference if you go to 785. There's, it doesn't, yeah. it, you're already at the top. Yeah. There's some big milestone numbers. Thanks for the question, Joseph. We also get letters down here in the basement, and uh, Matt wrote this one to us. He says, my 401k has got three options, Roth, traditional, and after-tax. Most of my 401k is designated toward the Roth option, but I have 5% in a traditional and 5% toward the after-tax is designated in bonds. I use this as a quasi-emergency fund. First question is, does that contribute toward my maximum $18,000 contribution? And uh, second question is, why would this be a bad idea? Great question, Matt. Let's tackle 401k and after-tax money. So really easily, uh, the after-tax contribution does not count toward your 19000 is what he meant to say, limit for 2019. Uh, it's purely extra. So usually you can't do the after-tax unless you've already maxed out the deferral amount, you know, pre-tax or Roth. But... Um, I don't know why I would use it as my emergency fund or why I wouldn't. I guess you can access it any time, but you're going to pay taxes on the gains. I don't know. It seems like an awful long way to have a cash reserve, like a lot of steps. Cash reserves are about emergencies and opportunities and liquidity. And it doesn't seem very easy to manifest that money out of that after-tax component where we see a lot of people using the after tax is to fund Roth IRAs that they otherwise couldn't, you know, if they make too much money or to fund extra Roth IRA money, basically. So you take that after tax money of your contribution throughout the year. Then at the end of the year, you roll that over into your Roth IRA. And in addition to your $19,000 Roth 401k contribution, plus your $6,000 Roth IRA contribution, you know, maybe you can put another $5,000 a year into the after tax side you know, you're, you're putting away $30,000 a year tax-free for the rest of your life. So I would use it as more of a tool in that regard than I would use it as a cash reserve. I don't think there's any reason to do it besides that, is there? Well, I mean, I see what he's doing with it. It's like forced savings. It's coming out of his paycheck, so he doesn't see it. He's investing it conservatively. So ergo, it's kind of there. But at the end of a year, let's say that he's had some gains and then he's mm -hmm. trying to pull out those gains as an emergency fund. Yeah, I mean, you'd you'd you know you'd pay ordinary income taxes on the gains. You know, it's like a non deductible IRA. So, uh, I mean, I it's a little bit of know thyself there, maybe. There also is an issue with after tax money. Once he let's say he goes to roll it to an IRA, and he's got part of it that's after tax and part of it that's pre tax money, or is already Roth money. I mean, he's got a mess. Yeah, and I mean really the only the only real reason to use the after tax like you said is to do the extra Roth contributions because all of those unintended consequences of having to segregate it and keep track of it and you know forever is is a really giant pain in the butt. It's it seems like it's just about as easy. Harder than people think, yeah. Yeah, I get that people do this because it's easy, but it seems like it's nearly as easy to just set up an another outside fund direct deposit that money that was going into after tax instead just have an automated direct deposit to x fund that's your cash reserve account um, yeah this, most payrolls will let you do two direct deposits so just direct deposit the other you know the 500 dollars a month that you were putting in the after tax just put it in your money market fund at there it Lines is bernstein or whatever yeah, yeah wherever know. it might be yeah uh thanks for the question matt if you've got a question for us the only difference between Joseph and Matt is Joseph's taking home the greatest money show on earth t-shirt. Uh, we do that for people that call in the Haven Lifeline. Matt just gets his question answered. But no matter which way, 
you want to contact us, here's what you do. StackyBenjamins.com. At the top of the page, it says ways to contact the show. If you specifically want the Haven Lifeline, StackyBenjamins.com forward slash voicemail gets you there. Thanks to everybody who's asked questions of the show. That's going to do it for today. What a fun way to start the week. If you're somebody who says, you know what, 2019, it is time for me to get my financial house in order and I need great financial help in my corner. OG and his team again have opened up the doors, taking on new clients in 2019. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash OG and that will get you started down the road to building your financial planning team. We are doing five a month for the first five months of 2019. So we'll see how that kind of shakes out from a service standpoint. My plan is to just, you know, if we end up with like eight people in January, you know, basically that means we got five in January and three more in February. We're just going to kind of keep motor in that way. So just uh, try to keep the service uh, reasonably consistent. Awesome. That's good to do for today. Uh, Doug, take it from here, man. What should we have learned today? So what did we learn today? First, take some advice from Larry Swedro. Thinking about diversifying your portfolio? Don't get caught with an under-diversified portfolio that relies too much on your home country's stocks. Second, that after-tax option in your 401k account? Nope, not a great idea if you plan to later roll it into an IRA. But the big lesson? Do not tell Joe's mom that it's National Thank God It's Monday Day. She'll just turn it into National Shovel the Driveway Day or something like that. Jeez. Hey, you know that's not a real holiday, right? Special thanks to Larry Swedro for joining the fun today. You'll find Larry's book, Your Complete Guide to a Successful and Secure Retirement, wherever books are sold. And don't forget, Stacking Benjamin supports independent booksellers, and you can too, while also helping out the show. Head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Powell's and buy the book, and they'll send us a small thank you. Thanks to everyone who used our link. This show was created by Joe Salcihai, produced by Richie Rutter-Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I'm a lot deeper than you realize. In fact, sometimes I just stand in front of my mirror and reflect. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. Hey, and special shout out to Gertrude for helping me shovel all the snow, though I thought Let's Go Get Plowed had nothing to do with a snowblower and a driveway. That lady can be very misleading at times. Epic move across country. I'll tell you the the thing that you don't want to do. Grab a cat. Take the tranquilizers that your that you gave your cat, and then go driving. Like Our, here, this looks like it worked on him. Hit me some. Uh, my spouse Cheryl and her friends, many of her friends that we know, work in the health field, and so they kind of know they they know a lot about human medicine. But when we called our vet. Our vet's receptionist said, oh, it's probably going to be something like a um, animal Prozac or like an mm-hmm. animal. Or, like you know, a Zoloft or something. Or, or a Benadryl. I don't know Zoloft. It's a Benadryl, yeah, yeah. 
neither one of those things were prescribed. Instead, Cheryl looked at what the vet gave us when we went and picked it up and said, I, th- this just doesn't, I don't understand why you'd use this. So we chopped up one early in the morning and put it in because we left at 5 a.m. Uh, by the way, got to Detroit at uh, 1 a.m. the following day. That was a fun day. But squash one up and put it in the cat's gravy because uh, our cat loves gravy. So put it in the gravy down most of the pill. There were a couple little pieces that didn't go. And then the second one, we held his mouth open. It took us, I'm going to say 10 minutes trying to get this pill down his throat. <laughs> Finally, he took it though. The pill did abs- The pills did absolutely nothing. The cat for the first 45 minutes just meowed nonstop in the cab of this U-Haul that I was driving. And so I had his litter box and I had his food out and I did something that probably is kind of stupid, but I was worried about like, what if he had to use the toilet? And I've heard from people that cats just kind of hold it in, in these periods. Mm -hmm. If I could hold it in for 24 hours, how great would that been in college and like bar night when (laughs) if you just, no, I'm going to hold it in a little longer. But the cat really got aggressive at one point about getting out of the cage. I'm like, oh, he's really got to go. So I opened up the cage. What was cool was he just came out out of the cage, sat down next to me. I think I sent you a picture. He sat down next to me and then hung out. And then every time that I stopped for gas, which was about every 18 miles with that (laughs) U-Haul, It's fant- every every exit and a half. Fantastic miles per gallon. Sh- Cheryl's driving our little Jetta, and every other time we stopped, she would get gas too. Not that she had to get gas, but I would put I would put between sixty and seventy five dollars in the U haul, and every other stop, she'd put eighteen in the Jetta. Yeah. And it was yeah. Well, you weren't driving a Jetta. It was it. It was amazing. But anyway, uh, when I would stop before I'd open the door, I'd just open up the I'd open up the cat carrier and I'd say, "Hey, dude!" And he would literally on his own jump in. And he'd jump in. I'd close it up. I'd get out, do all my stuff, and then and then uh, get back in, go down the road a little bit, open it up, and he'd come and sit by me again and just look out the window. It ended up being a pretty pretty fun guys trip. Hmm. Me and the me and the cat. You know, you and the. You and the kitty cat. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, uh, but what time did you leave? Uh, I said we left at five. That was the goal. We left at five thirty. Five thirty mm-hmm. in the morning, central time. Got there. So what? Six thirty Eastern got in 1 a.m. 19 hours. 1 a.m. the next day. Yeah. And, I've, uh, I've done that trip, man. I got to tell you. So we got maybe two and a half hours from the new house. And I was just thinking, oh man, does this suck? Like, I hate my life. This is just incredibly There's horrible. There's probably a hotel close by. Yes. But then I'm only I thought, two hours away. Yeah, but then I thought, I'm like, you know, I got two hours, maybe two and a half hours left of this. When am I going to do this again? And I'm listening to bowl games on the radio. I'm listening to the Texas-Georgia game. Mm-hmm. And uh, I bet my son, Nick, 10 bucks on each game just so I'd stay away. And, and by the way, that totally worked having just a little bit of skin in the games was fantastic. I was going to say, I don't think it worked in the $10. I mean, you lost your rear end, didn't you? All it, your teams lost. Didn't it they? didn't. Thanks for bringing that up. It didn't work in my favor. Thank you, Penn state. I'm looking at you. Oh, Penn yeah, state. They also smoked. Georgia, Who else did you pick? Georgia. I had Georgia. What the yeah. hell happened there? Central Florida almost, almost had a great comeback uh, against LSU and Iowa stuck. Oh, Iowa won, didn't they? Yes. Late. Yeah. Yeah. Iowa was my only win. So mm-hmm. I had to send my kid 30 bucks. Maybe I should just remind him that I put him through college and he's still down. Yeah. Just go. <laughs> just go. You just send him a negative $86,000 <laughs> tab. Like, hey, you paid this week's interest on the money you owe your mother and I. Right. 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 Here's your $30 that I will uh, take off the tab of all the money that I spent on you your entire life. That's what I did for, uh, for steak brother. We went up to Michigan to see the family, but he stayed here in Texas and my mom gave me his envelope of money and, uh, yeah, just a little bit of money, hundred bucks. And, and so I said, Hey, do you want the hundred dollars or do you just want me to Apple pay you the difference or Apple pay it to you? Cause I just Apple pay it. So whatever, just easy. Right. So I go, how do, how do I Apple pay negative 900? 
because he owes me a grand. <laughs> <laughs> Did he get the point? Oh, he got it. Yep. <laughs> yeah. He he uh, he had been not working for a period of time. He was holding out for upper management, just like they say in Christmas Vacation. But um, he, anyways, he wanted to be assistant manager, not assistant to the manager. He wanted to be the assistant to the regional manager. But anyways, he uh, he was telling me about how his new job pays weekly, which is actually a really cool, like a cool idea, right? Like every Friday, you're like, hey, I get a paycheck. You know, it's obviously one fourth of the month, but, you know, whatever. Yes. It just kind of helps with the cash flow. So we went out to lunch. He had a little break. And so he went out to lunch. He's like, yeah, it's really great. Da, da, da. I go, cool. So I pull out my phone and I do the Apple Pay request for a thousand bucks. Now that you're working again. <laughs> That's so nice of you. Just yeah. squ- squashing OG, squashing joy whenever he gets the well, opportunity. That's my theory, though, with family. If you give them money the first time that they want it, then you never have to do it again because they never pay you back. So you just, that's your, the one time. That's the card you get to play. Yeah. You just go, well, you know, I'd love to help you out, but. But hey. I mean, you, I'm still, I'm still short the, the two stacks from last time. Good lesson. Yeah. <laughs> 